Welcome back to our third lecture, or welcome to our third lecture for International Regulatory Frameworks for Climate Change and Environmental Management. So we're moving on from the UN Charter and the International Whaling <coughs> Convention to look at the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade and the Antarctic Treaty. So again, we're continuing our chronological exploration uh, of the major treaties. So in outline, we'll cover GATT, as it's commonly called, the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, originally signed in 1947, multiple trade treaties since then, but we'll use GATT as the hook to bring in trade uh, agreements. So there was major um, developments with the GATT agreement and the World Trade Organization um, following the Uruguay, Uruguay round of negotiations um, to establish the WTO uh, in 1986 to 1994. And there's a whole range of other trade treaties. We could do an entire course just on trade law. Uh, <clears throat> I'll just mention a couple. Agreement on Technical Barriers to Trade, 1994, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, TPP, which looks like it's dead um, with the new president-elect vowing to walk away from it. I've, I'm not going to shed any tears over the TPP, certainly. Um, but we won't cover, obviously, every trade agreement. I just want to flag, and we'll use GATT, as I say, as the hook for them. And then I want to move on to look at the Antarctic Treaty. Again, not a major treaty, um, in terms of you know, comparison with other big things that we'll consider. But I again want to come back to the Antarctic Treaty to understand it in its political and historic context, as well as um, thinking about issues like sovereignty. And as I say, I was late with lunch, so afternoon tea, we've got a whole range of um, biscuits, so a few chips floating around, and have a good munch, OK? So let's turn to look at GATT, um, 1947. So I want to particularly focus on a case study of palm oil development in Borneo, so Malaysia and Indonesia, to really unpack GATT. So the context is the same as the context we looked at for the UN Charter as well as whaling. So this is a period which I've arbitrarily defined from 1945 to 1960. Post-World War II rebuilding, um, rapid industrial growth in many parts of the world, driven by technological advances. Government and public concern for the environment is relatively low, and there's few environmental treaties negotiated. Um, there's also the Chinese Revolution, Cold War. It's really at its height through this period. There's the threat of nuclear war. is very real for the world. Let's focus on Borneo to think about trade. So Borneo, a massive island um, in Southeast Asia. Um, three countries um, have, well, it's Brunei is entirely contained within um, Borneo, but Malaysia uh, and Indonesia, um, obviously um, big chunks of Borneo as well. Um, and Borneo is an amazing um, island. Has, has anyone been to Borneo? <coughs> Right. I was just chatting with a, a colleague at lunch who's just come back from Borneo. She's overlooking at um, peat swamps there and how they can be better protected. So absolutely amazing um, island. I once heard an interview with David Attenborough, the famous um, British naturalist, and he was asked what was the most amazing place. And you know, he's been to every country, every continent, most well-travelled human being probably ever. Um, and um, obviously for decades working in natural... Um, you know, documentaries, and he was asked what was the most amazing place that he had ever visited, and he said Borneo in the 1950s. He said it was mind blowing. So, amazing place in terms of biodiversity. Um, here's some rainforest, um, yeah, just amazing forests and um, immense rivers, and amazing creatures. So, orangutan um, and a proboscis monkey. I've just got some random wonderful pictures from Borneo. Um, lovely butterfly, some incredible plants. Um, this is a blossom bat, which I take it is about as big as your little finger. Um, a male olive-backed sunbird. Um, pygmy elephants, which are pretty cute. Um, and in that context, so this amazing biodiversity, 
in that context, um, Borneo has undergone immense deforestation in the last few decades. So this is a map uh, showing forest cover loss. So the white was forest cover loss until 1900. So that's relatively small. It's really this area down in the southern tip, very small. The next one is light green, and that's forest cover loss in 1900 to 2000. So that's a fair chunk. But then in the last 20 years, the next green colour up and the projected forest cover in 2020 will be the darkest green. So basically the mountains, you know, all of the lowland um, rainforest pretty well wiped out. And when we say wiped out, just obliterated. So um, this is a picture from some of the rainforest destruction. Um, and there's a huge number of pictures like this that you can see. I'm sure you've all seen National Geographic or some sort of um, article about palm oil development um, in, in Borneo. So just complete, um, yeah. So here's uh, some of the, the sort of forests being cleared um, to make way for palm oil plantations. Uh, and in the distance you can see in those circles, see over there the one on the top right, you can see little rows of trees, so and also on the top, sorry, the top left, you can see the rows. Top right, you can just sort of see the plantations coming. And so we're we're taking out incredibly biodiverse um, rainforest and planting with a monoculture palm oil. And yeah, just going on immense, immense plantations of it. So what is palm oil? It's um, the world's second largest oil crop. It's used extensively in food, body care, industrial products. Um, it's basically the world's cheapest oil, vegetable oil. Um, an average Australian consumes about 10 kilograms of it per year. It's in pretty well everything. So examples of products containing palm oil or um, palm oil derivatives, um, biscuits. So um, can, who's got the packets of chips that everyone hopefully just had a little bit of? So, oh, are they down the front? Can you grab oh, them? So, I hope you all had a good munch. Now, can you read out? So, you've got the burger rings um, packet, which is only hardly anyone's eaten any burger rings. Um, so, we'll pass them back and you can have more of a munch. But, can you read out the ingredients of the burger rings? Okay, nice, good boys. So, cereals, so corn and rice. Uh, see, see the healthy burger eggs. <laughs> it's vegetable oil. Vegetable oil. Uh, Malted dextrin. Rice bran, salt, sugar, hydrolyzed vegetable protein, soy, flavor enhancer, food acids. Like yeah, all the good stuff yeah. down the end. Okay, it looks something like this, although I didn't say potatoes to start with, but basically here's just one that I've prepared earlier. Um, potatoes, vegetable oil, um, salt, sugar, milk solids, onion powder, uh, and all the good stuff. Okay, and now Doritos. Is that a similar sort of list? Yeah, same. So could you just read out what, it, what the major ingredients are? Corn. Corn. Vegetable oil. Vegetable oil. Uh, I don't know what that is. Mal maltodextrin. Maltodextrin, that's the good stuff. Yep, Whey that keeps powder. you fit and healthy. Whey powder. Whey powder, milk, yep. Uh, salt. Yep. De dextrose. Dextrose, yep. Sugar. Sugar. Mineral salt. Mineral salt. Cream powder, which is milk again. Cream powder, yep. Spices. Spices. Tomato powder. Tomato powder. Vegetable fat powder. Yep. Flavors, good acids. Yep. Onion powder, yeast extract, and natural colors. Yep. Okay. Well, no palm oil, so we're really lucky. Um, in this stuff that we've just eaten, we haven't eaten any palm oil. The, what about the vegetable oil? Well, it isn't listed. We haven't listed palm oil, so clearly there's not. It's not there, is it? Maybe or is gory. it? <laughs> it's in the vegetable oil. Basically, whenever you see vegetable oil listed on an ingredient, it will have a com significant component of palm oil because it's the cheapest vegetable oil. It's not normally separately labelled and food manufacturers are really resisting separately labelling it because um, of the public perceptions um, against palm oil. But it's really cheap. So in terms of world consumption, 
Um, these are the different um, vegetable oils. And palm oil, uh, at this, this was 2007-2008, um, was the mo most widely produced tropical oil. Um, it's also used to make a biofuel, but basically um, just beet soybean um, and then other, other oils, you know, really drop away quickly. It's really soybean and palm oil are the big ones um, gl used globally. So pretty well every biscuit, every chip, every thing that you consume that says vegetable oil is going to have palm oil in it. So that's pretty well everything. And lots of soaps. So, you know, when you're soaping up, having a wash at night, um, and you're using something that's got, it will almost certainly, unless you particularly go out of your way to buy a soap that says palm oil free, it's going to have palm oil in it. So, credibly widely used. Yes? Isn't South Australia just um, a trading regulation that we have to list palm oil? Yes, yeah, South Australia. So, we'll talk a little bit about regulations. The EU also brought in um, basically packaging laws, but it's been heavily resisted. I'm going to play you a little video. Um, it's an SBS Dateline story from 2010. Um, it's, I just really like it, though. It's from a few years ago, so there's a few facts of grown, but it's got this really interesting guy. I've edited it so that it will it'll take us about um, 10 minutes, but I mean, it's post-lunch, so I'm sure everyone's happy to just sit and um, watch some a docu a, extracts from a documentary. Thank you. 
location is 0337784 to the north and 0171324 to the east. That's my exact location where this activity is taking place. It's estimated that up to 88% of all timber logged in Indonesia is taken illegally. I took the coordinates I recorded to a former advisor to the Indonesian Ministry of Forestry, now turned environmental lobbyist, Willie Smith. So here we are. Willie punched our coordinates into the European Space Agency global mapping system. We have these images from the space agencies and they are set the radar images, so they penetrate the clouds, you cannot hide anything. And these are the coordinates where you have been into the field. And this area with the white diagonal lines here is due to Palma groups. Palma will develop a due to Palma only this concession. They supply a number of international traders who sell the oil to Asian and European markets. The area is classified as high conservation value forest. Spurgeon forest, under the Indonesian law, you cannot convert this high quality forest to an oil palm plantation. But as you see, it's still taking place. This is criminal. This should not take place. It means there's no hope left for the most endangered subspecies of the orangutan in West Kalimantan. <laughs> Today, 85% of the volume that Unilever uses is not sustainably produced. 
Unilever has made an ambitious commitment that by 2015, all of its palm oil will be certified sustainable, which means it's from plantations that have passed an environmental and social impact test. But there's a problem. The current supply system means it's not possible to trace the oil back to source to guarantee it doesn't come from illegal plantations. By 2015, will you be able to trace all of that palm oil from source? That is, that is, that, 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 it is indeed the intent that by 2015, we should be able to trace that. Should be able to or will be able to? Well, again, again it's the, the question that you're asking is, can you segregate that palm oil all the way through, on its route to the West? Right now, that is not possible. And even though some oil is produced on one plantation, which is certified sustainable, the oil will get mixed. And right now, it is not possible for us, with the volumes we have, to segregate that waste. You can see the difficulty that manufacturers face here in Rotterdam. The palm oil arrives on container ships from all over the world. It's then pumped ashore into giant storage tanks that belong to international palm oil traders. All trace of where the oil comes from disappears in the mix. But a traceable supply of palm oil has been proven possible by companies like Sainsbury's within their own brand products. This is one of your products with, with palm oil in it. Yeah. And right on the front of the box. Yeah. Straight in there. Made with sustainable palm oil. So it's pretty straightforward. Yeah. We're the first company we think in the world to put a product, a food product, on our shelves which had sustainable palm oil. It took around 10 years to get the first product got on the shelf. And we've had to do a tremendous amount of work tracing supply chains all the way back to the farmer at source. Until the industry can properly segregate palm oil right the way back to the plantations, palm oil from illegal sources will continue to find their way into products on your supermarket shelves. Recently, Unilever terminated a large contract with a supplier called Sinar Mass because of reports it was destroying high conservation value forests. Unilever has since told Panorama it intends to try and overcome the supply system problems so that no due to palm oil ends up in its products. Some of the UK's biggest manufacturers and retailers are trying to do the right thing, but their efforts are unlikely to slow the pace of deforestation. And the reality is, only 3% of the world's palm oil is currently certified as sustainable. Man continues to be the greatest threat to the orangutan. So, pretty basic editing there. Um, I, I like that uh, little film clip um, for a number of reasons, but I particularly like the way it traces it from source and then you get the view of Rotterdam with everything being mixed together and you think about the tremendous scale of the industry and the actual logistical difficulties if you're a manufacturer and you actually want to use it but you know you, your supply chain is incredibly difficult to manage so there's huge practical difficulties with with trying to regulate palm oil um, Um, so there's, if you follow palm oil um, and Borneo, you see there's a, a range of positive news um, intermixed with um, really um, negative um, things as well as uh, um, Indonesia, Malaysia, um, particularly Indonesia um, uh, government going through cycles of trying to basically uh, improve forest management and also deal with corruption. Um, and then 
seemingly reverting back to just um, yeah, not following through on the commitments. Um, so it's a really difficult um, environment to work in. Um, and obviously within that, corruption is a huge um, problem for governance in the area. So um, this is just a, um, a local NGO, Eyes on the Forest, um, talking about um, basically forestry corruption and just as an example of one of the local efforts to deal with those issues. So, you know, if you have regulations saying you can't clear an area, um, it's then got to be enforced. And a lot of the um, clearing in the areas can just basically be done by fire. So a lot of the forestry fires that cause then huge health problems for Malaysia and surrounding Singapore, surrounding countries, um, caused by basically people going in and just lighting fires and then allowing huge tracks to burn. So it's incredibly, um, yeah, incredibly difficult um, regulatory environment, um, let alone, you know, just at the national level in Indonesia and Malaysia trying to deal with it. Um, and yeah, this was just a story from last year. Um, Indonesia burns its government moves to increase forest destruction. In the midst of its worst fire crisis in living memory, the Indonesian government is taking a leap backwards in forest protection. The recently signed Council of Palm Oil Producing Nations between Indonesia and Malaysia, signed at the weekend in Kuala Lumpur, will attempt to wind back palm oil companies' pledges to stop. Sorry, wind back palm oil companies' pledges to end deforestation. This is despite Indonesia's efforts to end fires and palm oil cultivation on peatlands. If successful, the move will undo recent attempts to end deforestation from palm oil production and exacerbate the risk of future forest fires. I won't go on. That's just, you, if you follow it over a series of years, you'll just see stories, good stories and a whole range of bad stories as well. Um, if anyone's interested in doing trade, um, palm oil, you know, there's a, in terms of a um, topic for a research paper, it's an obvious one. It's a huge, huge issue. Um, and linked, as I said, with um, pollution in Southeast Asia of many countries with just, yeah, massive um, burning of the peat swamps um, being cleared for palm oil plantations. Um, I won't play that. It's just so this is some pictures from, again, last year. So you've got um, Indonesian Kalimantan and Borneo on the right, um, Indonesian South Sumatra on the left. As you look at it, you can just see the forest fires. Um, and the amount of smoke. So an incredible amount. This is um, in Borneo. So, and again, this is just last year. Um, you can see it's marked where all the, with the little red dots where the fires are burning. So huge, huge tracts of forest being cleared. And it, yeah, just another image. Um, last year was particularly bad. Um, I haven't really seen it so much in the news this year. Is anyone from um, that area that um, has knowledge of what's the situation like at the moment for air pollution, for forest fires. I don't yep. know about that, but I was in Indonesia this year, yep. during the winter time, and I was five years ago, and I was impressed about the difference in the area, in the quality of air, and Yep, if it was much better in Indonesia when you visited, great. No, not much better, much worse. Oh, much worse, oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, so you've had two visits to Indonesia, and you thought the air quality was much worse? worse? Yeah, so... Um, okay, well, um, huge issue, incredibly difficult um, to deal with for the countries directly involved, so Indonesia, Malaysia, um, you know, Singapore and surrounding countries that get affected by the pollution. But then if you think about it from the, a country like Australia or the US or, say, the European Union, if you want to try and deal with, um, you know, you want to try and... Because at the moment, you know, if you just if you just have unfettered um, trade and you and which basically just says wherever it comes from, the cheapest basically will use, then if you basically say, well, that's Indonesia and Malaysia's problem, we're not going to get involved, then you're basically, you know, you're the ones paying for the damage to occur. Um, so, can you control imports into your country? You you can't directly control what's happening in the country, but can you restrict? imports to, say, sustainably managed um, palm oil plantations. And that's where the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade comes in. So that was active, sorry, that was active fires in the week of 14 to 21, 2015. So it's just incredible. Um, and yet, um, this is um, dense haze in central Indonesian Borneo, 
from fires. So let's pose this question. Can Australia or any other country other than Malaysia and Indonesia, can we do something about it by controlling imports? So, and if we're thinking about a problem like this, let's talk about some different perspectives. Okay, so what do you think? If let's just take, I don't want to focus on Australia, but let's just take Australia. Let's now let's take the EU. Let's say we're in the EU. The EU wants to restrict because Australia is such a small market. You know, we basically it's US and EU are the two big markets. If if they impose imports controls, then producers take note because they're such a massive market. So if the EU says we're going to um, prohibit imports of palm oil other than sustainably managed, and then you define what sustainably managed is, and it's basically no forest that's been cleared in the last 20 years. Let's just say that's our definition. Um, <clears throat> what do you think... Um, so the Netherlands is um, part of the EU, but it's a member state of the EU. What do you reckon... Let's, let's come back to the Netherlands, actually. What do you reckon Indonesia and Malaysia... What's their perspective going to be on the EU's... Um, so it's a, a blanket ban on imports of palm oil that's not from a sustainably managed and it has to be certified. So and let's just say you're... Say um, each of them... Let's just take an arbitrary figure. They each produce, um, I don't know, five billion um, dollars worth of palm oil a year. So let's just say $5 billion worth of palm oil exports going to the EU. So that's your trade. And let's just say 85% of that you can't certify as sustainable. So you're talking at like, say, $4 billion of trade. What do you reckon Indonesia and Malaysia are going to say about the EU regulations? They're not going to be happy about it. So um, who's from Indonesia and Malaysia? Anyone? OK, can we have some nominated um, Indonesian people? So you guys over on the left, sorry, on the, the right, you're all from Indonesia. And um, so you guys down the front here, you're from um, Malaysia, OK? So you, I know you're a smaller number. I want to save you guys there for others. OK, so um, Indonesia, what do you think about the EU prohibiting um, unsustainable palm oil when that's going to cost you $4 billion a year? Sorry? I put Brits in the market, I said to China. You go to China, but like this is $4 billion worth of, of trade for you. It's one of the world's biggest um, importers of palm oil. You're, gonna, you're not going to be happy about it? You have to just transship it by a third party to <laughs> Okay, so you're going to avoid their regulations? Absolutely. What about Malaysia? Okay, you're going to be you're unhappy about it too. Okay, what about um, can we have say so you guys, you three there, you can be um, China. Okay, you're representing the Chinese government. What do you think about this control that the EU is putting in? Like it's not directed towards you, is it? But what do you? What's perhaps China's perspective on this? Well, do you think that if the EU gets um, very interested in putting environmental controls, um, maybe they might step into human rights restrictions as well? Can you see that this might... You know, you're not particularly interested in palm oil because you don't produce a lot of it. Um, but can you see... If you thought that the EU might get a bit enthusiastic about trade restrictions, what might you say about the palm oil restrictions? If they're going to start putting environmental constraints on goods that want to be imported and they're a massive market for your goods. Can you see your perspective might be self-interest? You're not very happy about it? OK, what about the US? What's its interest? They've got canola, but they can sell instead of Yep, well... Canola, possibly. They might be all for it, just from self-interest, their own production. Yep, if it's the Trump US, then they hate trade agreements. 
They hate restrictions of any sort. They might be opposed to it just because it's a restriction on trade. The US subsidises a lot of their farmers to produce... Uh, you don't, you don't so expect their position to be consistent. So no, sure, well, I'm surely just not. They might be happy about it because they can uh, get more of their farmers' corn oil and canola and everything into their own market without having to compete with this okay. cheaply produced... You might see it as a commercial competitor. You fully support it because you think it's a good well, idea. What about what about? Um, do you think um, it puts any um, obligation on you to? Because you're the other world's biggest market for palm oil. What about the U.S. restricting palm oil imports? Do you think you could follow suit with the EU? Be hard not to. I think even if it was Obama, I mean, the chances of restrictions on palm oil getting through the U.S. But, I mean, Congress is basically... Yep. Okay, so you might... U.S. might have either a commercial competitor, hey, this is good because we can sell our stuff. It also might feel pressure to do the same, and that raises a whole range of other politics. Let's skip over Australia. What about the Netherlands? So it's that Rotterdam where all of that palm oil is being um, imported to. So you're at, you're the point where it gets imported into the EU. Most of those Indonesian companies would have uh, roots in the Netherlands. Yep. So there might be they might have links. Yep. So there's links between companies that are based in. But you're. Can you see how your perspective is coloured by your financial... You know, you're such a massive port for Europe. You can have different... So there can be different perspectives on a dispute um, that are not just about the direct parties, but countries, particularly, I'd use the example of China, in that sort of situation, they might be opposed to the restrictions, not because of the restrictions themselves directly hurt them, but because... They're concerned about other things and you know other restrictions being so there can be games within games for international politics. So the key point here is there's a range of different international perspectives um, on this problem. And I'd also say that you know countries like Australia, the US, we recognise that we've done tremendous destruction to our environments. This is where I'm from in North Queensland. This is the Tully floodplain. So basically, you know, the whole floodplain was cleared decades ago. Uh, so all of the, the you know, rainforests, in, you know, we've got rainforests in North Queensland, but they're mainly what's left in the highlands and all of the floodplains basically gone to sugar, which is basically Australia's equivalent of palm oil. It's just that we did it 40 years ago. Whereas Borneo is basically going through the cycle that occurred here um, decades ago. So I'm not saying, you know, getting on a high horse and saying, you know, Australia has got some moral superiority. But um, if we're importing all of this stuff um, and contributing to the destruction in those countries, um, can we basically restrict um, imports to try and do something about it? Um, yep. Back on the, that role of the Netherlands, because they're not. I mean, their their role really being trying to improve our supply chain tracking. That's the main. The Netherlands role, yeah. I'm not. So we had a nice. There's a lady from the Netherlands. So what do you you take the Netherlands role? Okay, you can leave Indonesia, <laughs> go back to the, the Netherlands role. Um, yeah, Yeah, so shipping is a massive industry. You know, it's such a, you know, it's the port for, is it, Rotterdam's the biggest port for Europe, isn't it? Yeah. So just a massive amount of goods going through. Um, oh. But I don't know, they do have, like, historical ties with Indonesia, yep. coffee plantations, yep. like that. So I don't know if that influenced that as well. And ultimately the Netherlands is part of, Europe. So, and you know, it, there could be reasons why they support the controls 
Um, ultimately, there's still going to be a massive port. It may, may not affect them financially, but I just... You, I'd put, brought the Netherlands in because of the link in that film to them being such a big port. You know, you've got... They're part of the supply chain. Um, and that raises um, issues that it's not just about everyone coming together nicely and, oh, this is a terrible problem, let's all get together and solve it. Um, it ain't... doesn't work, you know, that nicely. Different countries have different perspectives and they can be protecting their own um, financial and political interests um, principally rather than trying to deal with a problem in another country. I saw recently that those peat uh, forests, the peat was some, you know, 10 to 30 metres deep. Oh, the uh, peat is amazing, in yeah. In that if it's burned, it would be an e ecological disaster. <laughs> It, it, it is an ecological disaster now. Like, and it's the question is whether it's. You just look at it and you just, yeah. I, I use that analogy of you know your child running in front of a car and you're trying to get to them and you but you can see the car coming and you can't get to them. Like that's what it looks like to me. It's just it, pretty clear that Borneo is. It's, a going, train, stopped. it's incredibly difficult. The the regulatory environment, on the ground, is incredibly hard with corruption with all of those issues and, and just basically people going in and lighting fires. And you can't have, it's a big place, you can't have people standing there with a, on every square inch with a, you know, patrolling it. People can just go in, light a fire, it burns, you know, I massive area. Imagine if you're a regulator and you go in, you'd want a bit of backup with you. I'm sure it's, I'm sure it's very difficult. Okay. Let's think about GATT, okay? So the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade. So the question is, can the EU or a country like the US or Australia, can we restrict imports of palm oil linked to environmental grounds? Like we're going to you know, stop it, restrict it in some way. Can we do that? That's the question I want to ask. So GATT, um, signed in 1947, Article 3, just as an example... The contracting parties recognise that internal taxes and other internal charges and laws, regulations and requirements affecting internal sale, offering for sale, purchase, transportation, distribution or use of products and internal quantitative regulations requiring the mixture, pressing, etc. should not be applied to imported or domestic products so as to afford protection to domestic products. That final sentence, what's that? It's the essence of what's called free trade. But basically free trade means no restrictions on trade. Um, and GATT is technical looking at other things, but here's just another example. Article 11. Um, no prohibitions or restrictions other than duties, taxes or other charges, whether made effective through quotas, import or export licences or other measures, shall be instituted or maintained by any contracting party on the importation of any product of the territory. Da, 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 da. Um, basically, no restrictions. So GATT is about free trade, unrestricted trade between countries. Yes? But would it be possible for like, a government to impose a new tax on, say, palm oil? Any product containing palm oil is now this much more tax than that would stop consumers from buying. Can you tax something based on that? Those are the, the sorts of things that GATT seeks to um, restrict. Um, certainly if there was a difference between... Um, you know, domestic production and um, and imports, then that's the sort of thing where you start to see red flags pop up. Um, if you don't have any domestic, um, it's still an, basically an import tax because if you don't produce any internally, then it's going to be goods coming in and you're taxing them. So, and those sorts of customs duties and those sorts of things, a lot of what f free trade has been over the last 50 years has been about dismantling those barriers. A lot of countries still have them, but um, the whole essence of free trade is to remove um, either restrictions um, or taxes that basically make trade more expensive. So that the idea is that trade will, you'll just have the cheap, the production will go to the place that produces the most cheaply, so that's the most efficient on a global scale. That's the idea. Um, I'm, I mean, there's a number of economists here. Is there any economists? Give me a better um, explanation of free trade. Well, it's the free movement of capital, really. Capital, but, but also production. Well, capital is productive. Okay. Capital production. Um, 
so that goods can basically move without... So if you're taxing things um, at your border, then that's a restriction and adding a cost. OK, so that's the essence of GATT is about free trade and no taxes based on that. Um, Article 20, though, is what I want you to be aware of. And there will be a question on the exam linked to Article 20. So you'll get a little scenario and you'll be asked to advise a country on whether there is uh, basically a breach of any trade laws. And what I want you to do is explain Article 20. So GATT is about free trade, but Article 20 allows for exceptions. Um, so there's the introductory paragraph, which is called um, the chapeau. It's a French word which literally means... Does anyone speak French? A little bit? So it literally means the hat. Um, it's C-H-A-P-A-E-U, I think, chapeau. Um, so the introductory paragraph is called the chapeau in treaty language. So subject to the requirement that such measures are not applied in a manner which would constitute a means of arbitrary or unjustifiable discrimination between countries which where the same conditions prevail, or a disguised restriction on international trade, nothing in this agreement shall be construed to prevent the adoption or enforcement of any by any contracting party of measures A, necessary to protect public morals, B, necessary to protect human, animal or plant life or health, G, relating to the conservation of exhaustible natural resources if such measures are made effective in conjunction with restrictions on domestic production or consumption. So these are exceptions where countries can restrict trade, but it has to be consistent with the um, chapeau that it basically can't be a disguised restriction on trade. So you can't slap a $500 tax, a, pan, you know, a kilogram on palm oil and say it's to protect um, you know, the orangutan while you don't have any tax on you know, your own palm oil production and you're basically using it as a disguised prop up to your own domestic production. You can't, the idea at least is that you can't disguise um, regulation um, to protect your domestic industries. So, necessary to protect public morals would be, I mean, that's not environment related, but so for instance, if there was. Um, you, know, you can think of any sorts child of thing. Exploitation child exploitation material or something like that. A country can say there can be no child exploitation materials, cannot be sold in our country, they cannot be imported, it's a criminal offence and you'll go to jail for a very long time. That's a restriction on trade, but um, it's perfectly acceptable under GATT because you'd link it into A um, about public morals. So... Uh, and similarly, religious, you know, if a country has a particular religious um, framework, they might have a restriction linked to some, so, you know, a country that, you know, religiously doesn't allow alcohol might prohibit alcohol to be imported. That's clearly a restriction on trade, but um, can be allowed under, um, under GATT, um, particularly because they'd be prohibiting the production within the, the state. The classic thing where you see discrimination is where there's a difference between how goods are treated if they're produced outside your country and how they're treated if they're produced inside. And when there's a difference between how they're treated, then that throws up a flag for basically discrimination, um, a, a invalid discrimination. Um, so um, there's a few other... Um, articles that have been particularly in the news um, recently. Um, so Article 6 is about anti-dumping um, and there's a suppl it's supplemented by an agreement on subsidies and countervailing measures. It gets really complicated really quickly but basically the, um, this is linked to a, a big dispute and it might flare up again with um, Donald Trump being elected president. You might have heard that he said he would slap an import tax on Chinese produced goods because China was a currency manipulator and they were basically subsidising the production of cheap goods. Um, and basically um, provisions in GATT, like Article 6, deal with anti-dumping and countervailing duties. So if a country um, subsidises the production of goods in its country, so say China um, paid manufacturers of 
solar panels to produce them really cheaply so that um, manufacturers sell them in the US for say $10 a panel and the Chinese government has contributed you know, $100 a panel so that the total cost or the total thing that the producer gets is $110 but most of it is coming from a subsidy from the um, Chinese government and if say the government is trying to basically corner the market and drive American, the US producers, I have been pulled up by folk from Latin America for calling the United States of America America, so I'm going to try and call it the United States of America because they correctly pointed out that there is Latin America and South America and there are, don't use the word, so the United States of America um, uh, could say, well, the, the Chinese government is subsidising the production of cheap solar panels so they can be sold for $10 per unit. Um, our manufacturers, it still costs us $110 to produce a panel. So even though um, we should be on an equal footing, they, both panels should be being sold for $110 per panel, China can sell, the Chinese manufacturers can sell their panels for $10, so no one's buying our panels they're all buying the Chinese ones, but they've been subsidised by the Chinese government. So that's um, when you start to talk about subsidies, um, dumping, and the US basically had a big dispute with China over basically exactly that scenario. I've simpl simplified the facts. But if you subsidise an industry so it can artificially produce cheap goods, then that's something where a country might have a tax on the import of your goods to basically have a level playing field for its own manufacturers. Can you see that? So it's not just about restricting trade at your borders, but it also might be about giving you a level playing field. And you can imagine how controversial this becomes because the importing country um, says they're subsidising their you know, goods, we're going to slap a tax on them. The country that's producing the goods says, no, that's a... Um, artificial restriction on trade. We don't subsidise our goods at all or any more than you do. So there's this big technical dispute involving billions of trillions of dollars worth of trade. Um, it's a, I say as a lawyer, it's a lawyer's picnic because, you know, you, you've got this dispute, huge amount of money involved, countries at loggerheads. How do they resolve it? Well, there's a World Trade Organisation that China and the US have um, joined up to, but... Um, Basically, it becomes really technical and really hard really quickly. Um, the bottom line I want you to be aware of, though, is um, GATT and other trade agreements are about unrestricted trade. Um, restrictions linked to environmental things, like saying you can't import palm oil unless it's certified as being from a sustainable palm oil plantation, that's a restriction on trade it might be able to be justified under Article 20 or something else, um, but it gets hard and it gets technical really quickly. And when you start to get a lot of money involved, countries have big disputes over trade um, really quickly. OK, let's um, just unpack this a little bit for um, a few other broader principles. So how do you interpret a treaty? Um, went through this before, but you interpret it in good faith in, accord in accordance with the ordinary meaning. Another fourth additional step that I just flagged for you, it's on that um, handout I gave you, I didn't talk about it before, um, but for, in some areas, like trade, um, decisions of international um, courts and tribunals might be relevant. So the particularly important ones is particularly the World Trade Organization appellate body. Um, the International Court of Justice and ITLOS, the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea, but for trade, the WTO appellate body is particularly important. And it's, there's been a series of cases about Article 20. So US tuna dolphin case 1991, US gasoline case 96, US shrimp turtle case 1998, Brazil retread um, tyres case 2007. So um, a lot of litigation against the US. So for instance, in the Tuna dolphin cases, uh, actually the shrimp turtle case is, is, a, is an easy one to explain. Um, basically the US tried to restrict imports of shrimps, which um, Australians call prawns, um, 
So they tried to restrict imports of shrimps um, and you couldn't import unless they were caught using nets that had turtle excluder devices, which are these things where if a turtle gets caught in the, in the, in the net, it's basically a grill with a little flap that will push the turtle out the top of the net so the turtle doesn't drown while the net's dragging along the bottom. So they're called turtle excluder devices or TEDs. Um, and basically in that grill, the prawns or shrimp just pass through. Um, so um, basically in countries like Australia, um, trawlers um, are required by law to have these turtle excluder devices to try and restrict or limit the damage that trawling does to things like turtles. Um, so the US passed a law saying you know, their own domestic fleet had to have these particular TEDs in, installed and they tried to um, limit um, imports to say any shrimp imported has to be certified that it's from basically um, a fishing vessel that's had one of these TEDs. Anyway, um, the US was taken to the WTO um, appellate body and lost on some really technical reasons. Um, basically because uh, a number of Asian producers argued that the turtles in, in Asia were different from the turtles um, in like the Gulf of Mexico where the TEDs that the US um, uh, restrictions were aimed at um, were located so that basically the US, um, the US um, laws were arbitrary um, and therefore unjustified. So um, that's just an example. But why do you think the US features in lots of cases? Because it's all cases where the US has restricted um, imports. Why do you think people sue the US? It's a massive market. If Australia does it, who cares? We're just such a, you know, the blip on the, you know, or a small country does it, then no one probably will sue you. Or they might, just because they don't want it, you know, others, like Australia, for instance, has got this, um, I'm sure no one here is crazy enough to smoke. But some people are, and these smoke um, packets now, they've got to be, Australia brought in restrictions where um, cigarettes have got to be in plain packages and they've got to be locked away in it. Like you'll never walk into a shop now in Australia and see cigarettes displayed because they're all in locked cabinets and it's all plain packaging. And when you get the package, they're now got to be, I think they're olive green or something, aren't they? They're like a, I don't know, they're plain, plain packaging. And it's been really controversial even though Australia is a really small market, why do you think cigarette companies um, basically complained like hell? It sets a precedent that other countries like the EU particularly, because they're probably not too worried about crazy US doing anything about health, um, but the EU particularly um, um, was looking at Australia's plain packaging laws and um, if they because Australia is now saying it's actually having a positive effect in terms of reducing the number of people who smoke. So the cigarette companies didn't want the Australian experiment to work. So there's been a whole heap of you know, cigarette litigation against Australia to try and have our laws um, found to be unconstitutional on, on a range of other things. But, so a small country might be sued um, in that sort of circumstance, but there's been a lot of litigation against the US because it's so big. And the US lost a whole series of cases. Um, basically, the principles that emerge is this, I've summarised it here. A trade measure can be employed to meet environmental objectives so long as it's not arbitrary or discriminatory. Measures to implement cooperative international efforts like the Convention on International Trade and Endangered Species um, are more likely to satisfy Article 20 than unilateral non-consensual measures. So, for instance, Australia restricts imports of ivory um, just basically has a blanket ban on them. Um, but it meets Article 20, even though it's a fairly arbitrary, it's an arbitrary because we don't distinguish between sustainably produced ivory and non-sustainably produced ivory like or illegally poached ivory. Um, so it's arbitrary, um, but it passes because of um, the Convention on International Trade and in Endangered Species, because it's this broad measure. But there's nothing like that for palm oil. So if Australia was just to try and ban any imports of palm oil, it would be, um, even though we don't have any discrimination, you, you typically see, as I said, if you've got a difference between how you treat domestic goods and imported goods, that's your classic discrimination. But in a country like Australia that doesn't really produce any palm oil, 
um, discrimination isn't the issue, but getting over the arbitrary hurdle. Because if, you, if you're not going to make it arbitrary, then you've got to have some sort of licensing system or some way, and it becomes really difficult and technical to administer. So if you, if you ban all palm oil, that would be arbitrary, even though you could prove 80% of palm oil is produced non-sustainable? Um, look, it gets really technical. Like, we've banned all um, ivory, but basically it's... It, it, it's it passes because of CITES, yeah. but with palm oil, we, you'd have real problems. And it gets just, I don't want us to get bogged down in trade. What I really want you to be aware of about is how bloody complicated and important this problem is. It is a big, big deal. Um, I want you to also have at least a broad understanding of, about the principles for GATT cases um, and be able to apply them in practice, um, at least to some, in some simple uh, so I'll give you a problem on the exam. We'll work on some examples of that as we prepare for the exam. Um, I don't want you to get lost in the detail, but um, just I'd like you to have a... I'm not going to go through those cases, but you can find any number of textbooks that tell you about you know, WTO cases. Just be aware about the broad principles. I'd like you to have a look at that. Um, and what you'll find is that um, there... Don't get lost in the detail because the earlier decisions are actually inconsistent with later ones. Like the early restrictions, um, this was from an article in 2002. The approach to Article 20, now mandated by the appellate body, is substantially different from the restrictive and somewhat illogical interpretations of earlier decisions, particularly the tuna dolphin decisions. In fact, the US restrictions on the harvesting of tuna, which were rejected in early cases, would now pass with flying colours. Um, don't get lost in the detail, but I'd like you to have a look at some of those cases and just broadly understand the issues, because it is trade is such an important um, issue, um, and basically arbitrary. It can't be arbitrary and discriminatory. Um, as I mentioned before, there's been a recent trade dispute between the EU and China, and as well as the US, over solar panel dumping, um, and yeah. So, GATT 1947. There was a World Trade Organization agreement um, in 1994, and this was a big step forward with international trade. So um, there's a whole host of WTO agreements as a result of this round of negotiations. Um, there's about 60 agreements, 550 pages. Um, they get really technical. Um, there's still ongoing negotiations about trade. Um, the agreement on technical barriers to trade, 1994. Um, gets really technical. So um, if you look at domestic action, say, on palm oil, um, this is from a few years ago, the Greens, our con um, Conservation Party in Australia, the Greens tried to get up uh, um, and were able to pass a bill about palm oil labelling, and it led to this act called, or a, a, this bill was proposed, the Food Standards Amendment, Truth in Labelling Palm Oil Bill, um, and they wanted that within um, six months the Food Standards Authority was going to um, develop approved labelling standards that prescribe that producers, manufacturers and distributors of food containing palm oil must list palm oil as an ingredient for the food. So anyway, this bill was um, passed the Senate, but it stalled um, in our House of Representatives and basically never got, um, never got up. But the EU... Um, has um, moved to require specific labelling of palm oil since 2014. Um, I won't go into foreign investment, but there's a whole other kettle of fish about foreign investment. You know, can you? So the idea with foreign investment is, say, can an Australian company or an EU company or a US company that's developing, say, a mine in Borneo? Let's just pick Borneo again. Can the country of the parent company, can you control what, the, what subsidiaries of the company are doing in countries that might have very low environmental standards or corruption or something like that? So can you know, a country, or say the EU or the US, can they control what their companies do in, in developing countries? And that raises a whole heap of other issues. Um, TRIMS, Agreement on Trade-Related Investment Measures, whole heap of stuff. Um, 
And just finally on trade, the Trans-Pacific Partnership was this, um, Obama was pushing it. It was basically the US getting together with Pacific countries to try and keep out China. And China's got its own looking for bilateral agreements and secret squirrel stuff going on. But it, it was negotiated by um, basically a whole range of Pacific countries other than China. Um, and um, one of the most controversial things in it was that there was to be um, what's called an investor state dispute settlement mechanism, which allows if you're a company that's invested in a country and you're unhappy with the laws that or changes in its legislation or laws or policies, you can sue that country for damage to your investment. Um, so the classic one um, in Australia being cigarettes. So um, under an investor um, state dispute settlement mechanism, Australia has been sued um, by Philip Morris, the big cigarette manufacturer, using a, an obscure trade agreement we had with Singapore. Um, and Philip Morris was using one of its subsidiaries in Singapore to sue the Australian government over the plain packaging um, legislation. Anyway, they lost that, but that's an example of a company using these mechanisms. They're higher, they're, um, I think they're really bad and they're heavily criticised, but they're really popular with um, in these trade agreements. Um, anyway, train, trans, the Trans-Pacific Partnership appears to be dead under um, the new Trump um, presidency. Hillary Clinton um, was pushed to also walk away from the TPP um, by Bernie Sanders. So even if she had been elected, she was saying she wouldn't go ahead with it. Um, I won't go into the TPP um, because, yeah, it doesn't. It appears that it's dead in the water. Um, cool. Okay, so let's wrap up on trade. Summary of um, GATT and other trade agreements. GATT promotes free trade and limits the ability of states to impose trade restrictions for environmental reasons. Um, however, you can restrict trade due to environmental reasons as long as it's not arbitrary or discriminatory. Um, and particularly if you're linked to a broad international regime like trade in endangered species, then those sorts of measures are likely to pass. Um, but if you are not working within a broadly accepted international regime, it gets really technical really quickly. Um, okay. That's trade, a whirlwind tour. We could spend the entire course on it. Um, as I said, I really just want you to be aware of what an important issue it is and those few technical things about Article 20. Cool? Hey, let's um, take a break, um, five minutes, and we'll come back and talk briefly about Antarctica. Yep. Have you got a question before we break? Yep. Great, great question. And can I just say that I wanted to reinstitute, this is my good question jar, so I didn't bring it along to start with, but basically you don't get one of these for answering a question, but if you've got a good question, then you get a chocolate. Um, so feel free to ask good questions, okay? So this is the good question jar. Um, so is GATT binding? Um, yes, um, and the sorts of litigation against, say, I'll just go back, the litigation against the US shows you know, the teeth that it has. And there's massive disputes between countries, but it gets really technical really quickly um, and really hard. Um, and of course, there are just this hypocrisy of many countries, like the US has a whole heap of restrictions on imports, like, for instance, sugar. Um, and corn, it, you know, it protects these industries at a domestic level. It doesn't have free trade. And yet, at least until the Trump presidency, you know, for decades it's, you know, it's promoted free trade, um, but it's, it's very much a um, using it um, to promote its own interests. And like the TPP, my view on it was it was really about US pharmaceutical companies wanting to impose their copyright um, and stop countries like Australia um, producing generic drugs um, that um, 
that copy that um, the drug producers um, were basically not able to be paid for. So that was my take on the TPP, without you know being too cynical about it. But my reading of it was that was what the U.S. was being pushed by drug producers, um, and so it was about copyright protection for them. So the whole idea of free trade um, it gets pushed forward as. Um, if I use the analogy of a Trojan horse, is that is everyone familiar with that? I know we've got different cultures. It's that story of basically, you know, there was a gift that was given to the the guys that wanted to invade um, Troy, wasn't it? The the city, and they put brought a gift um, and for and left it outside the city, and the people in the city thought that it was um, you know an offering to the gods or something. They pulled it in the city, and then there are a whole heap of soldiers inside. Um, and they jumped out and, you know, the, the city um, fell. And so the idea in, in our culture when we say a Trojan horse is looks like a gift, something nice, but inside it there's something really nasty. So free trade is often a Trojan horse for a lot of other nasty things that come in um, with the free trade agreement. Um, so uh, back to your question, is it binding? Um, Yes is the simple answer, but big countries like the US um, and China, uh, it can be really difficult to, you know, to bring them to account. Certainly the US has been attacked a number of times successfully though. Is that? Okay, let's take a um, five minute break, get up, stretch your legs, we'll come back and talk about Antarctic. Hey, we might start back, eh? Um, let's start back. Um, we're looking at um, general agreements. Dream, uh, excuse me. We were looking at the general agreement on tariffs and trade um, just before the break, and we're going on to talk about Antarctic now. Just thinking about GATT for a second. Let's just pause on on that. And think about the, that um, there are many restrictions that are perfectly acceptable on trade. A classic one would be something like um, public safety. So um, all the electrical goods that are on the table in front of me are all have been manufactured in Malaysia or Indonesia or China, um, not manufactured in Australia. Um, they all come in, though, with meeting Australian standards for how electricity is, you know, electrical goods. Um, that's, all, that's all the restriction on trade. So imposing you know, standards on electrical safety, for instance, or you know, say someone wants to import teddy bears and, you know, or toys and you have um, a list of restrictions on the chemicals that can be in them or you know, child safety so that you know, the children can't be electrocuted or poisoned by it or foodstuffs. Those sorts of things are all, will all be um, fine in terms of Article 20 um, restrictions, because they're for you know they're not arbitrary, um, they're not discriminatory. You know, if you have a electrical safety standard and you apply it to your own domestic industries as well as imported industries, then there's no discrimination. But also, it's not arbitrary because it's done for good technical reasons. So there's a whole heap of restrictions that we have on trade linked to safety, linked to labelling, um, which are fine. Um, and you, you know, you're used to them from, like we read the backs of those packets. Um, so there's food labelling laws in Australia so that consumers can know what you're eating. Um, but something like palm oil is, you know, within that. A country like EU can have, can require labelling. Australia could require labelling. But can you see how that's a really weak restriction anyway? Because how many people, like I do, I go and try and pick palm oil free products, but it's really incredibly difficult. You'll, you know, of 10 margarines like on a supermarket shelf, you pretty well have to choose the one that says palm oil free, which will be Nutlex or something like that, because everything else, it just says vegetable oil, and so you know it's going to have palm oil in it. So, but how many people bother to go and read the label and then, you know, take that step? It's very small. 
So labelling is the weakest form of, of restrictions on trade you can really think of. Um, uh, would biosecurity yep. come under that? So yeah, biosecurity. Is yeah, biosecurity is is um, like you know if there's um, things about quarantine that can all be legitimate um, restrictions on trade. They can be used though illegitimately. Like Australia used um, but the threat of banana disease for years. We were abusing the system to try and keep out cheap bananas produced in Fiji and in the South Pacific. Because we just basically, it was a tr we were using quarantine laws as a trade barrier. So, um, yes, they can be used, and they can also be used illegitimately to protect your domestic industries. Cool. So, um, trade really important. Okay, let's move on to the Antarctic Treaty. So, um, and you can see with GATT, we jump forward like in time. I'm just picking up like each major treaty, but then we'll jump forward to how it's implemented now, um, but really just picking it up along the way. So the Antarctic Treaty, 1959. Chris, yep. So again, good question. You deserve another chocolate. Um, can you just ban it, or um, is it? Um, and the simple answer is there is no simple answer. Um, that it becomes very technical very quickly, and you really have to look at the facts of each individual case and what's the nature of the good, what's the nature of the restriction, and that's why I want you to go and have a look at some of those cases, not to understand their detail but to, just to understand how complicated... So if you're reading them and you're thinking this is all really complicated, I don't understand that, then you pretty well join with the rest of humanity um, in that because it is really technical and difficult to understand. And don't worry about the detail. You don't have to understand that. What I want you to understand is how important it is and, and the broad principles. Cool? OK, Antarctic Treaty, 1959. Um, the context of this again, same context as we discussed before, um, World War II, sorry, and notice that we've jumped from 1947 to 1959 and I haven't picked up anything in between. That's because there was nothing major, in, no major environmental treaties during that period. So we've got this big jump where, and at this time, you know, 1950s, we didn't have like the World Heritage Convention wasn't around all the big conventions we have now, they just didn't exist. So it wasn't that there wasn't a need for them, it was that they just weren't there. We jumped to 1959. It's still in this period of post-World War II rebuilding. Rapid industrial growth, public concern for the environment is low. The Chinese Revolution, the Cold War with the USA and, and Russia is um, continuing. There's a threat of nuclear war. And it's really that final part that is the precipitating factor for the Antarctic Treaty. So as background, um, there's uh, I think it's seven countries that claim territory in Antarctica um, based on um, Australia. Australia's claim was originally based on um, English exploration and claiming the, the continent for or large parts of the continent for the United Kingdom. And then in the 1930s, um, the United Kingdom basically gave away territories that it didn't want to um, retain to um, countries that were part of the Commonwealth, so part of the, the family of, UK, of um, countries that had been um, uh, established by the UK. So Australia in the 1930s inherited this big chunk of Antarctica as claimed by um, the UK and the French had 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 also a small exploration and claim in that little sliver there. That, so this is directly south of Australia. So they, get, they basically um, gave their claim to Australia and Australia then maintained the claim and established bases in the 1950s. You can see directly beneath New Zealand um, is the New Zealand claim. Again, that came from the UK. The UK kept a claim um, basically um, south of South America. So down from Argentina. Um, and South America. Um, there's overlapping claims between Chile, um, Argentina and the UK. So they overlap. 
and obviously they dispute each other's and the validity of each other's claims. But they're based on not only um, proximity but exploration and etc. The Norwegian claim is a bit is different. It's got a sort of wavy thing. Everyone else claims from a particular um, is it longitude the ones that go down? Um, so basically they have these sector claims which are like a big um, piece of pie. They go from 60 degrees south um, to the South Pole um, basically like a pie. Um, and, but the Norwegians do it differently and they've got this sort of um, fuzzy wavy thing. Um, it's different from the others. But anyway, these claims are all made and Australia has three permanent bases. This is Katy, one of Australia's permanent bases. Um, sorry? And so these, these claims were, were made in the, um, you know, based on Australia and New Zealand's claim is based on English exploration and claiming that area. It was uninhabited at the time. And I've given you a handout on, um, I'll actually just grab that now. So if you pick out a handout, I've given you on sovereignty and you see there's it um, how you establish sovereignty I think that your handout is in a slightly different order I worked on it before I put it up but this is an earlier version of it so basically sovereignty is um, it's notoriously difficult to define but it's a fundamental principle of international law that a state can generally control all activities within territory over which it has sovereignty. So um, it's a concept that's basically um, in essence it's about um, the power and right recognised or effectively asserted in respect of a defined part of the globe to govern in respect of that part to the exclusion of other nations or states or peoples occupying other parts of the globe. So basically it's the right to govern a particular territory and it's linked to land um, as well as um, limited maritime zones around it and we'll talk about sovereignty and sovereign rights tomorrow in relation to UNCLOS. But basically how you could get sovereignty, there were a number of different ways. Um, until 1945 in the UN Charter, conquest was a way, you know, countries would invade each other and the winner then basically was the ruler of the, air, the area that was won. So Australia, for instance, sovereignty was gained um, by conquest. Um, the United Kingdom sent out a fleet and basically um, conquered uh, the Aboriginal peoples um, and subdued them, basically, and so Australia established as a country um, in, originally it was a series of colonies from the United Kingdom and then it merged together in a single country and federation in 1901. So that's how Australia came to be, um, the government of Australia came to be sovereign in um, here. Um, so that was conquest uh, until 1990. 1991, 1989, 1991 I think it was, Mabo. Um, so Australian law, um, horribly, um, until um, a famous court decision of our High Court, um, um, Australia, Australian law was based on, sovereignty was based on, an, on the idea of terra nullius, which is an idea that um, if land is land belonging to no one, if you basically effectively occupy it, and control it, then you can gain sovereignty of it. So terra nullius means land belonging to no one. So Australian law was based on the premise that the traditional owners of the land, so the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, that they weren't real people, that they had no culture, they had no laws. Uh, and so it was very racist um, and it basically for, yeah, for over 100 years in Australian legal history, that was the basis of our sovereignty. And that was overturned by our High Court in this famous decision um, called Mabo in 1991, which was brought by a man who's now deceased, a Torres Strait Islander, um, uh, who brought a claim um, establishing that 
um, that a um, native title existed, uh, and our High Court recognised that. Um, but it's really a story. Native title is a very sad part of Australian law. It's a really a, a story of dispossession um, and great loss to the traditional owners. We, we now recognise um, native title and um, no longer regard that Australia acquired sovereignty through acquiring land that was ter terra nullius because there was no, no human beings here and no society here. We now recognise that there was a society and now the basis for our sovereignty is really conquest. Uh, and this Similarly, in the United States of America, it was, a, it was obtained through conquest of the traditional owners. And, yeah. um, but until 1945, conquest was a legitimate way to gain sovereignty, but um, the UN Charter, Charter prohibits it, at least in, in theory. Obviously, what Russia is doing at the moment um, in the Crimea um, is basically taking back some territory from the Ukraine. Um, so, and they're looking to annex part of the Crimea back into Russia. So, yeah, you've got a question? Yes, so this is part of It really depends. So, in, for instance, in New Zealand, um, the Maori people were able to defeat the British in their invasion of New Zealand and they ultimately signed a treaty, the Treaty of Waitangi. So um, there was an agreement between basically the British or the United Kingdom forces and the, um, the Maori people. Um, but that didn't occur in Australia because basically, uh, yeah, there's a very sad story in Australia of the, the yeah, the the killing of um, the traditional peoples. Yeah. After we've recognised um, like traditional titles of certain lands and areas, does that mean that the Aboriginal people have sovereignty over that place, and therefore are they still like are they are you allowed to be under sovereignty? That is a great question. Um, do the native people then have sovereignty? And the answer is no. Um, but basically, um, the Australian government still has sovereignty, um, but and it gets into a complicated um, discussion and abstract sort of legal concepts about radical title and the extinguishment of native title. So the traditional owners are now basically within the Australian nation. There's no separate you know, Aboriginal nation within Australia. They're still part of the Australian nation and subject to Australian law. So if an Australian law says you can't murder someone, then you can't on... A traditional person can't come and go and, you know, kill someone for a traditional offence, even though under traditional law it might be acceptable to do that. You can still be charged with murder and sent to jail. So um, there is only this, you know, the one sovereign in Australia, um, but native title exists within that legal system and can be extinguished. The really sad thing and why in Australia is that our legal system, a lot of traditional people were taken from their lands um, and put in settlements, apart from being killed outright. So they're taken from their land and then not allowed to return to their country to manage it and live with it. And now, after we recognise native title, maybe 30 years later, um, one of the bases for extinguishment of native title is that you no longer practise your traditional laws and customs. But if you think about how unfair that is, if your parents were taken from your country and put in a settlement and you couldn't go back to your original country and now you've lost your native title because, um, because you're no longer connected to your country, it's just so patently unfair. Um, it's really yeah, a very sorry um, part of yeah, Australian history and we you know, we really need to address it more than just saying sorry. Anyway, that's a aside. Um, there's different ways for obtaining um, sovereignty. One other that I'll mention, and I'll talk about this again when we talk about UNCLOS and, and Alaska, um, is you can buy it. So Alaska, um, I'm sure many people know the United States of America bought Alaska from Russia um, a long time ago. Um, and, yeah, um, you can buy land, but it rarely happens. <laughs> um, we'll talk about that 
how that came to be tomorrow. So that's um, session, so um, voluntary transfer by treaty. Um, so one of the things that I would just mention in that context is while conquest is no longer recognised, um, if you look down in the footnotes, um, I talk about basically... Um, you know, you could think about it and you could think about all these countries that have been conquered over time, why can't you go back and, you know, if you were conquered 200 years ago, why can't you claim that nation now? And um, basically international law basically says um, you've, got to you've got to accept existing territorial boundaries. Um, and, you know, there can be complications on that. But basically the boundaries that are here now are what's recognised and you can't just go back and say, well, that was conquered from us 200 years ago, we want it back. And it gets complicated in well, countries like the breakup of the USSR and re-establishing boundaries, places like that. OK, so that's terri territorial sovereignty and... Why I mention that is, if you think about um, Antarctica and you think about the basis for establishing um, sovereignty, Antarctica is a big landmass. It's remote and inhospitable, but places like it's very similar to places like Greenland, um, which are you know very sparsely populated, largely covered in glaciers. Um, so remote, remote, inhospitable places. There have been a whole series of disputes about sovereignty. And under international law, it's relatively easy to establish sovereignty over remote and inhospitable places. Greenland was a famous case in the 1930s about the status of eastern Greenland, and sovereignty was established for that on relatively um, little effective occupation. Um, Antarctica is different from, say, the Arctic. So the Arctic, there's no actual landmass there. It's basically floating sea ice at the top. But Antarctica is a big continent. It's land. It's remote and inhospitable, but there is no real reason why under international law you can't get sovereignty over it. Um, and um, my view is Australia has established sovereignty over at least the coastline because it's effectively occupied it. Um, but why do you think hardly any countries recognise Australian sovereignty? If, if you just accept, just, just take it as a given that legally Australia does have sovereignty, why do countries like the US not recognise, you know, US is one of our allies, why don't they say, well, you know, you guys help us out a lot, we'll recognise sovereignty in Antarctica. Is it because if they're not given their own share, then it's not really worth it for them to recognise us? Like they yeah. Basically, the US, Russia, China, they all came late to Antarctica. So it had already been claimed by a lot of countries by the time that those countries came along. So they've pretty well taken a position where they don't recognise anyone else's sovereignty or anyone's sovereignty. They, the US and Russia maintain the right to claim sovereignty in the future, they say, and they've got bases there. But basically, um, it's a political decision because they want to maintain the ability to potentially claim sovereignty later or just use the resources there. And if you recognise someone else's sovereignty, then you're basically giving up that fight. So it's basically a political act, and that's really why countries don't recognise anyone's sovereignty. It isn't that legally it doesn't exist, or you know, if you a court of law wouldn't rule that, yep, Australia has sovereignty over that big chunk, um, or that Antarctica is anything really special. It's a big landmass. You should be able to have sovereignty over it. But um, no one recognises it, and it's a political um, decision. Just, but I mean, I compare this to like Taiwan. I mean, you know, when you compare the illogical nature of no one recognising the Taiwanese government's sovereignty over Taiwan, it's just like crazy because that just stares you in the face how factually correct. Like, it's just illogical. So, um, sovereignty and recognition of it isn't necessarily about what's right. That is a fantastic question. So how do we manage all of this? That is a great question. Can I go on to the Antarctic Treaty right now? The Antarctic Treaty. Okay, so 1959. It's only 14 articles in length. It's very short. But get Article 1. 
Antarctica shall be used for peaceful purposes only. There shall be prohibited, amongst other things, any measures of a military nature, such as the establishment of military bases and fortifications, the carrying out of military manoeuvres, as well as the testing of any type of weapons. Why the hell is that Article 1? I mean, who wants to go on... Well, in Article 5, any nuclear explosions in Antarctica and the disposal there of radioactive waste material shall be prohibited. Is that crazy? Who wants to go and do that? Why do you think, in a, in a treaty that is so short, why do you think that that is right at the start? Because those were the concerns of the time. That's it. Um, and even though that wasn't a question, that deserves a chocolate. So, um, that's exactly right. This treaty, and that's what I emphasise about understanding the historical and political context of these treaties. This treaty was negotiated when it was a rare show of... Um, cooperation between the USSR and the USA in the height of the Cold War. And basically they, they decided, because there were all these potential um, theatres where World War III could start, and basically the two of them decided that we'll just leave Antarctica off limits, that you can't go and blow things up there and do more nuclear testing, and we won't have any military there as well. So it's just basically um, an agreement between the superpowers at the time to leave Antarctica off limits. And so that's a real positive. It's hugely significant, like this for 1959, at the height of the Cold War. Um, Article 4, though, is really interesting. It's um, about dealing with the sovereignty issue, because Australia is a party to this treaty, and the US and Russia are. So how do you reconcile the competing views on who? Because why should Australia agree to something? If, we're sovereign, if we have sovereignty, then it's ours. We don't have to agree to anyone else doing things here. It's our country. That's what Australia could have viewed it as. Yep? Um, but you're saying that Australia has sovereignty because we have bases down there and we've like squatters rights or whatever kind of thing. So Britain kind of seeks the land to us. But if America and Russia at that time also put bases down there, then what makes it our claim any different to their claim now Have a read, I don't want to get into the technicalities of it, have a read of the um, handout I've gone into using Antarctica as an example and there's a good um, explanation from Julian Triggs, that lady I mentioned before who's the um, head of the Human Rights Commission who's been attacked by the current um, federal government um, repeatedly for, heaven forbid, standing up for human rights in Australia. I mean, she's the Human Rights Commissioner. <laughs> shoot her for doing a job. Um, anyway, um, she wrote, um, her PhD was on um, Australian sovereignty in Antarctica. It's a great book. Um, anyway, I've got a quote from her there, and it's just basically looking at the historical development of, and sovereignty principles of it. Um, but Article 4, yes. It's a fantastic point. It's not a question, but again, yes, what a, it would create a conflict. And what about for Australia? Um, like Australia in terms of military might compared to the USA and Russia, particularly in 1959, like what's Australia going to do to those two superpowers? Uh, you know, are you going to pick a fight with them? So that's a very much a real politic sort of consideration for Australia. But let's have a look at Article 4. OK, Article 4, nothing contained in the present treaty shall be interpreted as a renunciation by any contracting party of a previously asserted rights or claims to territorial sovereignty in Antarctica. So that's for Australia and the other claimants, saying, we're agreeing to this treaty, but don't think that we're not continuing to claim. B, a renunciation or diminution of any contracting party of any basis of claim to territorial sovereignty in Antarctica that may be, etc. That's the US and Russia, who basically hadn't claimed but want to basically keep the option open. C, prejudicing the position of any contracting party as regards to its recognition or non-recognition, basically. So no prejudice to anyone. And then two, no acts or activities taking place while the present treaty in, uh, is enforced shall constitute a basis for asserting, supporting or denying a claim to territorial sovereignty in Antarctica 
or create any rights of sovereignty in Antarctica. No new claim or enlargement of an existing claim to territorial sovereignty in Antarctica shall be asserted while the present treaty is in force. Is that clear? No, it's not. The purpose of Article 4, this is from Trigg's um, book, I just love this. The purpose of Article 4 was to preserve the apparently irreconcilable interests of claimants, potential claimants and non-claimants. As a result, this ambiguous article states what it doesn't mean and doesn't state what it does mean. It is deliberately obscure, leaving each state free to interpret the article consistently with its particular interests. While Article 4 creates a purgatory of ambiguity, more positively, it enabled the parties to move forward to establish the treaty regime. So shoot these lawyers. They've deliberately written it to be obscure, so no one can really understand what it means and everyone can have their own interpretation. Um, crazy. But when you've got parties that can't agree on something, you, they've created this so it's ambiguous, and then you get the other things like everyone agrees we're not going to have nuclear weapons there. Everyone agrees we're not going to have military there, so let's have that agreement. Let's not fight about sovereignty, because the reality is Antarctica is so remote and inhospitable, um, it's very difficult to mine or use the natural resources anyway. So that's the reality. It's bloody hard to survive there. So no one wants to go farming there, and even mining has been prohibited for the next 50 years. But it, for a lot of it, you've got to get through you know, a mile of ice You've got this massive glacier, it's impractical to mine it. There's no doubt there's huge oil and gas reserves there, but actually getting to them is incredibly hard. So Article 4 is deliberately ambiguous. Crazy. Um, and then Article 10 um, represented... This is just the... Sorry? Was there... Oh, sorry, Article 9, yes. Representatives of the contracting parties named in the preamble to the present treaty shall meet in the city of Canberra within two months after the date of entering the force of the treaty, etc., and establish measures for basically other things. So this is setting up the meeting of the parties to then um, agree on the management of Antarctica. So it's a really short treaty establishing broad things like no military, no, no nuclear weapons, and then let's work out everything else later. And every, I think it's every couple of years, the delegates to the Antarctic Treaty um, Consultative Meeting meet. So this is one from 2006. Now, notice that they just look like ordinary people. They're just there in you know, the same sort of clothes as we're wearing here. So we could be the meeting of the Antarctic Consultative Committee. You know, there's no, there's no, they're not all Rhodes Scholars. They're not, you know, they're ordinary people like you and me. And they're all delegates to these international meetings. Okay, so it could be part of your future career. Now, after the, under the Antarctic Treaty, there's been a what's called the Antarctic Treaty System has developed. So there's the Antarctic Treaty 1959, and then there's the Convention on the Conservation of Antarctic Seals 1972. So you can't kill seals. Um, CAMLA, which is the Conservation of Antarctic Marine Living Resources, and also the Madrid Protocol on Environmental Protection. So, which bans mining for the next 50 years. So, and uh, this is called the Antarctic Treaty System. It's been highly effective um, and widely regarded as yeah, a, a great example of international cooperation. Um, there's ongoing difficulties, things like creating marine reserves. There's been some progress in that um, recently, but um, basically there's ongoing um, management by all the parties of Antarctica without resolving the sovereignty issues. Um, just as an example um, of a ex previous exam, um, here, this is a short answer question from a previous e exam. Article 1 of the Antarctic Treaty provides, Antarctica shall be used for peaceful purposes only. There shall be prohibited, amongst other things, any measures of a military nature. And then paragraph 2, the present treaty shall not prevent the use of military personnel or equipment for scientific research or for any other pur peaceful purposes. Um, and then it says an aircraft from the US Air Force is used to resupply the Antarctic base, McMurdo, um, which is used for US scientific programs. The crew of members of the aircraft are military personnel. Discuss whether this constitutes a breach of the Antarctic Treaty by reference to the principles for interpreting international treaties. So um, can I just point out, I've given, I've given if, I, if, if this was a question on the exam, I've given you the, the treaty provision. I'm not expecting you to remember you know, Article 1 of the Antarctic Treaty, it's there. And this question is not about 
remembering, rote learning, you know, a provision of a treaty. It's about understanding the principles of treaty interpretation. So the basic thing there is you interpret a treaty in good faith according to its ordinary meaning. So in answering this question, you could say Articles 31 and 32 of the Vienna Convention require that treaties are interpreted in good faith according to the ordinary meaning. So they have the principles. That's what you've got in your handout. Now, interpreting Article 1 in good faith according to its plain meaning, is the US in breach from what it's done? No. Who thinks no? Why? Maybe not you, because you're, John, you're, I know you'll get it. Okay. So who's, someone else? Um, is it because the US Antarctic base isn't a military base and they're not carrying out military maneuvers or testing any weapons? Um, well, it's the personnel going down. Yes, that's true. The, the US base is, in, is for research. But what about the US? It's the US Air Force that's going down to resupply the base. Fantastic. That's a great answer. So the wording of paragraph two says you can still use military personnel um, for scientific research or other peaceful purposes. So if they're just resupplying the research base, on the facts you're given there, it's military personnel being used for peaceful purposes. That's completely legitimate. And you get there from the plain words of the treaty. And just with a simple principle, plain words of the treaty, simple answer. Does that seem okay? Cool. And I haven't given you Article 4 and asked you to interpret that because that's... Article 4 is, an aber is sort of an aberration. Most treaties are like this. They're straightforward. They're meant to be interpreted. They're meant to be clear. They're meant to tell you what you've got to do. Um, Article 4 is, is odd, but it had a particular purpose. They should, it should be clear like this, saying exactly what you can do and can't do. So, you know, it's really clear. Antarctica shall be used for peaceful purposes only. There won't be any military bases or fortifications. That's really clear. But on the facts, that's not occurring. Everyone happy with that? Cool. OK. Yep. Well, the purpose of Article 4 is to allow the different competing views to, to agree on the other things. So Australia has signed up to this treaty. But we don't want to, in the future, be, for it to be said, but you've signed up to the Antarctic Treaty. You've given up your sovereignty. And similarly, the US, which wants to maintain a right to claim sovereignty in the future, it doesn't want to have agreeing to the treaty held against it in the future. So it's all about basically creating a, this... The, the, the thing that we can't agree on, let's not agree on it, let's have Article 4, and we'll all interpret it in different ways, but then it allows us to cooperate on things we can agree on. So it's about avoiding the, um, basically the things that can't be resolved. Is it a place saver for future negotiation? Yeah, potentially it's a place saver, but it really was about just getting on with the other things um, because they couldn't resolve it. Yeah. Um, cool. Okay, um, so take home points. I want to move on to our research design workshop, but take home points. Um, from this. International trade has enormous impacts on the environment. It's really difficult to regulate. Um, restrictions on trade can be imposed on environmental grounds so long as they're not arbitrary or discriminatory. It gets really technical really quickly what they are. Um, measures to implement cooperation, cooperative international efforts such as the Convention on International Trade and Endangered Species are more likely to satisfy Article 20 of GATT than unilateral non-consensual measures. Um, and the historic and political context can be crucial for understanding a treaty, and Antarctic Treaty is a great example of that. You really, you wouldn't, if you just picked it up cold, you look at Article 1 and think, how could anyone think to bloody, or Article 5, how could anyone possibly be thinking about, you know, blowing up a nuclear weapon there? That's just a crazy idea. But we're viewing it with, you know, 2016 eyes, not 1959 eyes. Um, and yet, yeah, treaties are sometimes written in deliberately obscure words, but I should really add to that. Generally, you can interpret them. They, they're meant, they should generally be clear. Um, 
anyway, there's summaries in you know, that training manual I've given you if you particularly wanted to look at Antarctica. But really, you don't need to go into that the depth. I'd, I'm happy if you just understand broadly Antarctic Treaty, Antarctic Treaty system, manage cooperatively, understand the historic and political context. Okay, that's the lecture on um, GATT and, um, and, and the Antarctic Treaty. So I want, to, I want us to take a break first, but we'll take a break and then I want to just leave our lectures for a moment and return to talking about um, research. So we spend the remaining hour of the day talking about um, our research designs and, re and ideas. Does that sound good? Okay. So let's take a five minute break, get up, stretch your legs, we'll come back and talk about research. <laughs>